All right, so hi everyone. I think we're gonna get started. Um, welcome to the webinar. My name is Kelsey Taylor with the Fraser Basin Council and I'm the program coordinator for the Salmon Safe BC program. And I'll be the host of today's session. I'm here in our Vancouver office with our Salmon Safe BC team, including Teresa Fresco, our program manager, and Christine Dorwin, our communications coordinator. I'd like to first note that we're hosting this webinar from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. When we're talking about protecting salmon, it's important to remember the land that we're working on and who we're working with. And I'm excited that we have a representative from Tsleil-Waututh as part of our webinar today. This webinar, The Benefits of Salmon Safe Certification for Urban Development, is the second in a three-part series called An Introduction to Salmon Safe Certification for urban development. The series began in February 2018 with our first webinar providing an introduction to our urban development certification program and we'll conclude with our third session in February 2020 which will provide an introduction to salmon safe certification standards. These webinars are a new communications tool for the salmon safe BC program and we are very excited to see the level of interest and support for their delivery. Please stay tuned at the end of the webinar for more information about upcoming sessions. Also, don't forget to like our Facebook and Twitter pages for the latest news on salmon safe activities and events, and our Fraser Basin Council YouTube channel to access recordings of all of our webinars. Of course, this webinar series would not be possible without the support of our funders and supporters listed here. We wanted to give a big thank you for their generous contributions to enable the Salmon Safe BC program to do its important work. So before we jump into the webinar program, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping points. The first is audio. You may notice that I have a blanket mute on all attendees. Because we are expecting a large number of participants, this is just to ensure that we don't get any background noise or feedback that may interrupt the webinar presentation. We will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like us to address, please enter it into the chat box that you can find on the GoToWebinar menu. When we get to that section of the agenda, I will be reading those questions out in the order that we've received them. We would also like to know who has joined us for this session. So if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, please note your name, your organization, or affiliation, and, and where you're joining us from today. So today's session will aim to provide an overview of the benefits of salmon safe certification for urban development from four perspectives, a First Nation, local government, designer, and a perspective from a certified site. We will have five short presentations from our speakers, followed by a question and answer session, and then we'll wrap up. So I'm very excited to introduce our five speakers that will be joining us today. Teresa Fresco, our program manager, will kick things off with a brief presentation on the Salmon Safe program. And then we will have Lindsay Ogston from Tsleil-Waututh Nation, Melina Schofield from City of Vancouver's Green Infrastructure Team, Valerie Presoli from Mountain Equipment Co-op, and Lucas ozoa Monjo from Dialogue. So take it away, Teresa. Thanks, Kelsey, and a big thank you to everyone on the line for joining us this afternoon, and happy Halloween. Um, hoping some of you are in costume as we speak. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a quick overview of the Salmon Safe program, but I did want to encourage those seeking a more in-depth pres presentation to view the recording of our first webinar, which uh, Kelsey had mentioned, and that introduces the program in more detail. And we'll provide a, a bit more details at the end of this webinar on how to access that recording at the end of the session. So Salmon Safe BC is one of Canada's uh, first peer-reviewed certification programs that recognizes and promotes urban land and water management practices that mitigate impacts on our watersheds and of course our salmon. Salmon Safe actually began in the United States in 1997 by the Pacific Rivers Council in Oregon, and over the years has evolved into its own nonprofit and eco label. It is delivered through a network of partner organizations along the Cascadia Corridor, and you can see those on the right side on the map. And those organizations operate as far south as the northern tip of California and as far north as Alaska, you can believe it, and now here on this side of the border in British Columbia. 
Salmon Safe BC launched in 2010, beginning with its agricultural certification program, and then in 2013, it launched its urban certification program. And since late 2018, all Salmon Safe programs have actually transitioned to Fraser Basin Council, and now we are the sole delivery organization for all of Salmon Safe BC. Salmon Safe has five certification programs for different landscape types and uses, and these include our agricultural certification, which is for farms and vineyards, parks and natural areas, urban campuses, which can be both universities as well as corporate campuses, infrastructure, and urban development, which of course we'll be focusing on in our discussion today. I also wanted to acknowledge that Salmon Safe has three firm accreditation programs, including those for construction development and design firms. And I also wanted to give a, a shout out to Dialogue, um, who will be presenting in this webinar, as they are the first BC firm to pursue Salmon Safe accreditation. We're really looking forward to uh, continuing working with them on the next steps for that. Although Salmon Safe is a standalone certification, it is compatible with a number of other certification programs, including LEED, Envision, Living Building Challenge, Built Green, and Sustainable Sites, among others. Uh, the most direct complementarity is with the LEED program. Um, any Salmon Safe certified site can receive an extra credit under the Innovation and Design category for LEED. The Urban Development Standards for Certification focuses on five key areas when we evaluate the site. And these include stormwater management, water use management, which uh, pertains to the external water use, primarily for irrigation for landscaping, erosion prevention and sediment control. Uh, this is typically assessed during the site's construction phase, pesticide reduction and water quality protection. This pertains to the treatment of the landscaping on site, but also water quality during the construction phase. And finally, overall enhancement of urban ecological function. And this pertains to the overall biodiversity values of the site. So it could include innovative elements such as pollinator pathways, use of native species, et cetera. There are three essential elements to the scope of assessment and certification uh, to be thinking about. And the first is assessments that can be conducted for buildings in the design phase. But we also wanted to note that um, assessment and certification can be done for buildings that are already completed. Site inspections are undertaken by a third-party independent BC-based assessment team, and we have experts in stormwater, aquatic biology, hydrology, watershed management, landscape architecture, and conservation planning, just to name a few. And finally, that the salmon safe standards are peer-reviewed by the science and academic community and that they are based on the biological needs of salmon. So I wanted to finish uh, this overview by giving you some examples of sites that we've certified here in the Lower Mainland, as well as some forthcoming site certifications. The very first site that became Salmon Safe certified in British Columbia was the Mountain Equipment Co-op head office in 2015. Uh, this site is located in the False Creek Flats area of Vancouver, and I won't steal Valerie Sunder. She'll be speaking more to the site um, shortly. A year after that, in 2016, we certified the Vancouver International Airport, which became the first Salmon Safe certified airport in the world. And I like to tease our U.S. colleagues in, in Salmon Safe uh, down south that we did beat SeaTac to the punch. Um, so it was pretty exciting to have an airport here in BC to become the first in the world. And in fall 2019, we completed the certification process for the MEC flagship store, which we are looking forward to announcing at the store opening, scheduled for spring-summer 2020. Two more sites that are up and coming for Salmon Safe Urban is the Albert Street site in Port Moody by Marcon and the Keith Drive site by Dialogue in the False Creek Flats area of Vancouver. Both of these sites have successfully completed their pre-assessments, and we really look forward to continuing on to the next phase when the projects break ground. I also to, wanted to acknowledge that I know we have a, a number of participants um, outside of the Lower Mainland area from different parts of British Columbia. And although I've provided some Lower Mainland examples here, the Salmon Safe BC program is BC-wide, so um, any projects within British Columbia can apply. And with that, I'll pass it over to Kelsey. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Lindsay Ogston is a biologist from BC, and she currently works as the Environmental Programs Manager for Tsleil-Waututh Nation. She completed her undergraduate degree at Simon Fraser University and her master's in science in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Toronto. 
So take it away, Lindsay. Awesome, thank you, and, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I am the Environmental Programs Manager at Slayer Tough Nation. Uh, I'm gonna be going over some of our proactive stewardship initiatives and then outline how they align with the Salmon Safe Program. Uh, so Slayer Tough Nation, um, uh, the reserve is located uh, near Deep Cove um, in North Vancouver. The traditional territory extends in all directions from this map. But for most of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing um, on the work done in Burrard Inlet. Slayotuff means people of the inlet, and that is Burrard Inlet here. So Burrard Inlet has had many different impacts um, that have happened since contact. I'm going to go over a few of them now. Um, so herring were extirpated in the late 1800s when a dynamite fishery ran for three years. In the 1970s, uh, bivalve harvesting was closed. Uh, due to health concerns from pollution that the shellfish is no longer safe to eat, essentially. Uh, there's been a general decline in habitat type and function and connectivity. There's also big issues with uh, pollution. So uh, either point sources where we know where the pollution is coming from or non-point source, things like stormwater, where um, the exact source of it is unknown. There's also a lack of coordinated monitoring or general stewardship oversight. Um, there was an entity that existed in the 90s that sort of functioned as this. Their funding was cut in the 2000s and they, they disbanded. So different entities, um, you know, federal government, provincial government, First Nations and municipalities are doing their own initiatives and their own monitoring, but there isn't necessarily an overarching organization looking at everybody. Uh, there's also a general lack of data and regular data collection. So despite uh, Burrard Inlet being, uh, you know, one of the busiest ports in Canada, uh, bordered by Vancouver, the busiest city in BC, uh, even basic oceanographic data sometimes can be hard to get a hold of, especially consistently over time periods. So Slater has, um has seen these impacts to the inlet that um, traditionally would have functioned as a really important food source. 90% um, of the protein that Slayotuff consumed pre-contact was coming from Burrard Inlet. Uh, and we're not at that anymore. We're now, now at about 1%. So Slayotuff has a vision for Burrard Inlet where it is a productive, diverse, and resilient ecosystem. It's a place where community members can harvest wild marine foods and that, that wild marine foods are safe to eat. People aren't going to be sick if they harvest them. The water is safe to use. Um, the water is clean. Uh, important habitats are plentiful, productive, and connected, and that biodiversity and key species can persist. The quantitative goal that we have for a lot of these initiatives is to have 10% of the protein that slow uh, community members are consuming come from Burrard Inlet. So bringing that up from one up to 10, it's not at 90, but it's definitely uh, a goal we wanna hit and keep improving. So part of uh, untangling this ball of yarn that is the impacts and path forward uh, for Burrard Inlet, uh, we created a guiding document uh, called the Burrard Inlet Action Plan. It's the science-based First Nation-led initiative to improve the health of Burrard Inlet. Uh, the goal was to summarize existing scientific knowledge. There is lots of data out there, but it may be um, not public, or it may be inaccessible, or it may not be put into, um, it may be in a PDF, it may not be in a way that you can analyze it easily. Identify the priority issues, uh, identify knowledge gaps and research needs, and develop a shared stewardship vision. Have all the users and people who live around Burrard Inlet have uh, a vision that everyone can get on board with of an inlet that everyone would like to use and is safe to use. And then to prioritize near-term actions. Uh, we're working on you know, 150 year timelines, but what can we do right now? Um, and what can we do by 2025 for some low hanging fruit um, to improve the health of, of Burrard Inlet? So the action plan outlines uh, five goals, 16 strategies, and 66 actions. There are a number of actions that relate to um, salmon safe, including expanding creek and outfall monitoring, reducing pollution through source, source control, and encouraging um, for the uh, adoption of best management practices or accreditations for reducing non-point source pollution. We recently hosted a stormwater science symposium, and uh, stormwater is definitely 
Um, and that for those people who uh, may not be aware, stormwater is uh, uh, water that's coming down from rainfall onto in previous surfaces like pavement and maybe picking up contaminants or pollutants that are on that pavement and then running into creeks and then running into the ocean. Um, so things like copper can end up in streams and they can um, cause fish mortality. And so having stormwater mitigation measures in place are, are really important. It's something that um, is really complicated to address, but definitely has a big impact of salmon. Uh, the action plan also outlines to increase available fish habitat and to build relationships. Um, you know, you can't do everything by yourself. It's a matter of, of connecting with other people who are also doing good work and then working together with them. Uh, one other thing that we're doing to improve water quality is updating some provincial guidelines, and I'll speak to those in a bit more detail. Uh, we are working with the province uh, Ministry of Environment to update the water quality objectives for Burrard Inlet. Uh, the objectives are policy that limit uh, chemical and physical conditions in outflows. Uh, the objectives for Burrard Inlet were done in 1990 uh, and they were provisional. So they're, they're quite old, so they definitely need updating with new science. And so we've been working with the province to update them, but we wanted to do it in a more community or uh, collaborative way. So we created um, a roundtable group of people interested in water quality in Burrard Inlet. This includes other First Nations, all three levels of Canadian government, federal, provincial, and municipal. There's uh, representatives from industry and academics and NGOs, and there's representatives from the Fraser Basin Council, which is great. And uh, we all kind of get together and we talk, put our like water quality nerd hats on and talk about water quality. And basically you break down each um, pollutant into categories and then you make a chapter for recommendations. So there's a copper chapter, there's a fecal coliform chapter. We have about five chapters done um, and we're hoping to complete all of them in the next two years. So a bit of an ambitious goal, but we're hoping that we can meet it and stay on target. Oh, and then the goal after this project is done is to then make recommendations to the province for these to become the actual water quality objectives for Bird and Let. Uh, we also have a cumulative effects monitoring program, and it's a holistic place-based approach. And what we wanted to do with this program was describe the arc of change over time in Burrard Inlet. Um, we have bits and pieces of how it has changed, but the exact um, morphing of the ecosystem is unclear. So we have data that's like current condition data, but we don't necessarily have that in pre-contact baseline data. So we're using traditional ecological knowledge and also the archaeological data to get uh, pre-contact baseline. Um, and so the archaeological data can help us by doing uh, DNA testing. You can take fish bones from middens and then um, the DNA is still intact up to like even 10,000 years old. And you can um, basically analyze it down to species, down to sex, and get an idea of what the ecosystem looked like before contact. Uh, and then we're also collecting current condition data on the ground with water quality monitoring. Um, and then we're feeding that into a cumulative effects model uh, to look at the changes um, in the ecosystem over time. We also have climate change projects. Um, my coworker Sarah is working on a community-based climate change resiliency plan. This is an on-reserve project looking at the uh, hazards and vulnerabilities that will be happening due to climate change and then to address them um, with mitigation measures. And this is done with input um, from the community about where they would like to see things prioritized and how they would like to see mitigation measures done. We also comment and review on all federal climate change uh, legislation and regulatory processes. And we're also doing a lot of on the ground uh, data collection. We do water sampling, both chemical and physical, with uh, CTD and Niskin water sampling. We do habitat mapping and assessments, eelgrass, forage fish, kelp, and riparian. Uh, adult spawner sur surveys and juvenile minnow trapping and out migrating fish estimates. These are mostly concentrated in the Indian River watershed, a uh, very important ecosystem to the nation. And we do shellfish surveys as well as shellfish tissue sampling for heavy metals and um, shellfish poisoning. And 
quite a bit more, but I will leave it at that uh, to stay on time. And so our overlap with Sam and Safe really comes from a shared stewardship vision of we both have an interest in seeing the preservation of important ecosystem species like salmon for the future. And doing this, um, you know, every little bit counts. One rain garden makes a big difference if everyone is doing it. Um, and that, you know, we're a small team here, we can't do everything. So building those relationships with others so that we can work together and really make many hands make light work sort of thing. And I just wanted to also share a, a really positive story that we had happen this summer, actually. Um, so herring, as I mentioned, were extirpated from Burrard in the, in the late 1800s. Um, and, you know, there hasn't been a herring spawn in Burrard Inlet since that anyone has seen since this summer. So the photos at the bottom here are of herring eggs and our field crew, they were out doing um, actually some from other work for data monitoring, they were doing some seine netting to get an idea of out migrating chum and they said, wow, that, there's a lot of seagulls over there and there's a lot of ducks, like what's going on? Let's check it out. And the whole beach was just covered in eggs. And that summer, you know, the, the seals came in and the whales came in. Um, I don't know if people saw in the news that there were orcas in Burrard Inlet and they were most likely following the seals that were following these herrings. So it really was um, very inspiring for us to see, um, you know, the, the health of the inlet do, make a step to return and like, uh, herring are such an important species in an ecosystem and to see them come back really was so encouraging for us. So it made us, you know, realize that, yeah, even if you're, you know, you're working really hard, but you're like, oh, am I making a difference? You know, things are making a difference. And so, you know, breaking it down into small pieces and if it's just one little rain garden and in one little project, it's it's important. It counts. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's my talk there. Hopefully, I didn't ramble on too much and go over time. But uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. All right, thanks so much, Lindsay. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, next Melina Schofield, who is the manager of green infrastructure implementation for the city of Vancouver. Melina is a professional engineer with over two decades of public and private sector experience, with a long-standing dedication to sustainability and innovation in the municipal sector leadership development, and collaboration across disciplines. She and her team are leading the city's ambitious Rain City strategy, a cross-departmental green rainwater infrastructure and urban rainwater management initiative. So yeah, thanks for joining us, Melina. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you, uh, Lindsay, for the shout out to Rain Gardens. That's great. <laughs> okay, so I'm, um, we're really enthusiastic to be able to talk about what we're trying to accomplish with the Rain City strategy and very, very interested in the potential of salmon safe certification in terms of um, moving forward on how we can execute on um, pollutant management and more holistic water thinking. So the Rain City strategy is a high level sort of long term vision for how we um, manage rainwater in the city. And what we're really trying to do is challenge ourselves to think about how we can better mimic the natural processes that have been disrupted in our city over time through development and changes to our watershed. So we're looking at how we can bring in a combination of like engineered and natural system approaches to basically protect, restore, and mimic the natural water cycle. So our vision is that we value rainwater as um, a valued resource for our communities and our natural ecosystems in how we've developed uh, over the past 100 plus years. Oftentimes, we're actually treating rainwater actually as a waste product. It flows across our rooftops, it flows across our hard surfaces, our roadways. Uh, we generally are putting it into pipes and then discharging it into our receiving water, which as Lindsay mentioned, is very problematic from both a climate resilience and an environmental perspective. So thinking about the future and trying to reimagine how we manage rainwater in the city, we're looking at three key areas. Uh, the first is around resilience and thinking about how we prepare for climate change with heavier rain events, heat waves, flood risks, um, water supply and demand, and a variety of uh, shocks and stresses that will come with that, as well as water quality. And I'll touch a little bit further on that because there's a very direct link to the Salmon Safe Initiative. 
And then of course, thinking about our community and in the long term, our livability, our equity, and our, our reconciliation with our indigenous peoples, and how we are um, thinking about healthy urban and healthy natural ecosystems as vital to um, all of those elements. Yeah, so where we're really interested in understanding better uh, the potential of salmon safe through developments or through infrastructure projects is really how it connects to protecting habitat and protecting ecosystems and the kinds of things that we can do on the land that actually have a big uh, influence in our aquatic ecosystem. So for Vancouver, our water quality issues related to our sewer and drainage system are really twofold. The first is we are a combined sewer city. There's not very many of them in the province of British Columbia, so it tends not to get as much attention as it might in this province, but many cities across uh, the country, across North America that were developed before the turn of the, the 20th century were built with combined sewers. So Toronto, Montreal, Edmonton, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco are all cities that have this common challenge. And what happens basically is that the rainwater that's collected off of our rooftops, off of our hardscape and our roadways is flowing into our pipe network that is combined with sewage coming from the households and businesses around the city. So when we have rainfall events, oftentimes the capacity of those pipes is exceeded and they're not able to convey all of that water to the wastewater treatment plant. And so what happens is it actually overflows into our receiving waters. And this is actually a picture of the Clark Drive outfall. So obviously uh, thinking about some of the interests expressed by Lindsay earlier uh, that the Tsleil-Waututh have around protecting aquatic ecosystems and having food fisheries in Burrard Inlet, uh, thinking about pollutant sources related to combined sewage is a very significant challenge. But it doesn't just stop there, because I know sometimes people get very focused on the importance of removing the sewage from the combined sewer overflow. Uh, we agree with that most certainly, but actually the other element is that the stormwater itself is actually highly toxic to our aquatic ecosystem. So really a combined sewer overflow is more challenging in that it involves both sewage and polluted stormwater. And for many folks, it may be um, not common knowledge or commonly understood just actually how polluted our typical urban rainwater runoff is. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, Lindsay mentioned of challenges with like things like copper and zinc. And so whenever you're breaking your vehicle, you're generally actually creating residue and heavy metals that are actually being uh, distributed on the road network. And then when it rains, that rain actually picks up those heavy metals and they end up going into our pipe system and into our receiving waters. Uh, there's been some phenomenal research happening in Washington State through the Washington Stormwater Center about the impact that tire wear, so little bits of debris that's wearing off of people's vehicle tires, is actually um, now been shown to be one of the most toxic elements in particular for a couple of different species of salmon that are uh, native to our local waters. And so, you know, in addition to the more obvious things like hydrocarbons, um, sediment, litter, heavy metals, and a whole range of pollutants that are coming from tire debris are proving very, very problematic. And they've done extensive research around Seattle area about how this is actually affecting um, mortality rates. It's affecting uh, their spawning that many of the salmon are actually failing to um, lay their eggs and spawn before they're actually passing away and that they're seeing a direct correlation with rain events and discharge from urban roadways and such. So for Vancouver, we're really wanting to think comprehensively about how we address these two quite significant environmental uh, challenges that come with our sewer and drainage systems. So as I mentioned, around the Seattle area, and we don't have the same degree of uh, data that I'm aware of for Vancouver, if you look at the most dense and urbanized parts of the city, the water that's being discharged from those areas is actually causing quite high um, salmon mortality. And so how we manage pollutant loads close to where the rain, uh, rain falls and try to avoid um, pollution in the first place is really important. On the positive side, their research is also showing that bioretention systems through green 
infrastructure is very, very effective in actually managing the pollutant load and the impacts on salmon. So they've done all kinds of research that's looked at storm, urban stormwater runoff that's then been filtered through a green infrastructure system using bioretention strategies, and that actually the fifth fish are having a very high uh, survival rate, whereas previously they were dying within hours of exposure. So this is just a snapshot of the fish using well water, storm water that's untreated, and then uh, filtered storm water that has gone through bioretention. And again, they're showing that the green infrastructure systems have been highly effective to meet the desired outcome. Uh, I just want to give credit here to the OceanWise team who've got a really excellent uh, piece of work that they've put together in the past couple of years related to tracking pollutants around the province. So they've done a very high quality baseline for 50 locations and 14 of those happen to be in and around Vancouver. You can see there's a bottle of our, our urban stormwater runoff. So sometimes members of the public or even sort of municipal folks think that stormwater is actually clean because it's just rainfall, how bad could it be? But actually it is quite contaminated and our testing is showing that. So I've really um, aligned with the need to do more monitoring and analysis to understand that and then to develop uh, interventions to support it on private property or through our public infrastructure. And I just wanted to highlight the Clark Drive outfall, which in the Oceanwide Pollutant Tracker Initiative showed that uh, prescription and personal care products was the number one pollutant at Clark Drive. And of course, this is the number one location where we have the highest volume of our combined sewer overflow. So we know that it's really critical to help address combined sewer overflows to try to get water out of the pipe system so that we reduce the occurrence of these overflow events that's yielding both sewage and polluted stormwater into our receiving water. So the Rain City strategy is actually going forward to Council uh, next Tuesday on November the 5th. And we're really excited to bring it forward to Council. It's been about two and a half years of work. It's been a very uh, significant collaborative effort, not only across our department involving five major departments, 21 directors and over 40 different branches, but it's also involved um, engagement with community, with industry, and an expert panel to really help shape a paradigm shift in our city about how we think about and how we manage water and the application or potential of green infrastructure to meet our needs. So, and just in terms of some of the big transformative directions, um, one of the, the biggest ones that I wanted to highlight as it relates to Salmon Safe is that we want to strive to become a more water sensitive city. And that means really thinking about our land use, and our community planning and our building designs and our public infrastructure and our public spaces and how all of those are integrated in a way to be more uh, sensitive and conscious of water management at, at the outset. And that's quite a big transition for our city to be pushing in that direction for a more integrative approach. It's oftentimes uh, people will plan either a site or a development or a whole area and they'll say, okay, this is our, our ideal concept plan, okay, engineers come in and tell us how to service it with the water infrastructure. So what we're advocating for basically is to say that actually we need to have that upfront in our process of thinking about how and where we'll manage water as part of our community planning and our developments. And I know that that's a big part of the process with uh, Salmon Safe. Of course, we have an urgency to re respond to climate change, so both on the mitigation side and adaptation. And for many people, how they will experience climate change is either through too much or too little water. And so we see a really direct connection in terms of um, our building designs, our public space designs, for how water management can play a vital role. And while Salmon Safe may be focused on the water quality benefits for Salmon Safe, it's actually human safe as well, because there's a lot of uh, stressors that come with urban heat, for example. There's a lot of energy consumption that comes with urban heat. So developing systems that retain more water on site, allow more evaporation of water into the air, um, and more trees and greenery that are uh, absorbing less of the heat is actually like nature's air conditioning system in our urban development. Uh, we have a major new initiative to accelerate actions around the water quality issues that I mentioned before, and in particular, the combined sewer overflow, but thinking also broadly about the stormwater pollutants. 
And then we're also trying to shift our approach to take a more watershed-based um, approach to our infrastructure servicing, our community planning, and thinking uh, more spatially about natural systems, urban development, and the supporting infrastructure. So I've highlighted here um, six of our objectives for the Rain City strategy, uh, which I've referred to um, previously here, just about removing pollutants from water and air. So we are also thinking about carbon sequestration and air pollutants. Uh, reducing the volume of water entering our pipe system. This is quite uh, critical for us, not only in terms of reducing combined sewer overflows and thinking about climate resilience and increasing precipitation, but also we're a growing city and we need to preserve capacity in our existing pipe system and use it as long as we can because it's very very costly to upgrade pipe systems and right now we've got six billion dollars worth of underground infrastructure and that would be a very significant affordability issue for us if we had to dig it all up and replace it with bigger pipes due to uh, climate change or other pressures um, looking at how we can um, manage impervious areas increase the total green area and bring more green and natural systems into the city mitigate urban heat and harvest and reuse water. So when we look at the salmon safe and the um, the different elements that they're trying to advocate, we see a really, really strong alignment. So just in terms of our targets, uh, Vancouver, our council has adopted a target to capture and clean 90% of Vancouver's average annual rainfall. And what we'll be proposing on Tuesday is that we target an implementation rate for green rainwater infrastructure that manages 40% of Vancouver's impervious areas by 2050. And that means in all different lands, so public lands as well as private lands. And so for many, many years, uh, Vancouver has had a quite limited um, or even no requirements to manage rainwater on private property and there has of course been some great leadership um, from a number of development members of the development community and a lot of that has come through the lead system that they wanted to get points for uh, stormwater management but now that we're really dealing with the realities of our pipe system being at or near capacity the challenges and realities of all the overflows that are happening in our system as well as the cost of servicing growth and upgrading our infrastructure to meet new demand as well as uh, climate change um, pressures on the system. There's a really uh, strong environmental, social and economic imperative to think differently and to have everybody do their part to manage more water on site, closer to where it lands, and to try to do what we can to take it out of the pipe system. And where we do have to convey water, of course, we want to try to address the pollutant loads. So uh, currently, we have a adopted design standard that's part of our regulatory obligations uh, that all municipalities in the region have through the Liquid Waste Management Resource Management Plan. And so ours is currently set at 24 millimeters per day. And we've recognized through our work on the Rain City strategy with the challenges around climate change, increased precipitation, as well as the extent and urgency of the combined zero overflow issue that we actually need to manage a lot more water and much more aggressively. So we're proposing to council that we double that performance standard to 48 millimeters. And currently in uh, public property, actually we've already been applying that now for about two years and it's going quite well. And we're going to be uh, adopting that for our own civic facilities as well as our park areas subject to council and park board approval. And then we're going to be uh, proposing that private property capture and clean 48 millimeters by 2022. So with Salmon Safe, <clears throat> we know that they're not prescriptive about how much water needs to be managed because that really is something that varies jurisdiction by jurisdiction, both based on climatic issues as well as their system and localized needs, but this is where we're at in Vancouver. And just to give a snapshot of where and how this is important, there's a, a picture in behind there. You can see looking over False Creek at downtown Vancouver. And if you think about where does the rainwater go in a city that consists of concrete and glass and then concrete sidewalks and asphalt roadways, where does the water go? And you know, in a natural system, the water would be absorbed back into the ground, 
some of it going to our aquifers, some of it going into streams. It would be absorbed by trees and plants, evaporated and evapotranspirated. So we're really trying to create new pathways for water in the city. And doing that, um, obviously, streets and lanes are a big opportunity for us. But the biggest opportunity really is going to be in the private realm and looking at private developments and the role that they have in um, holding back more water and managing more on site, whether through infiltration, evapotranspiration, so returning it to the air, or harvest and reuse. So, Melina, just so, a nudge from, from the team here. Um, we're, we're running a little bit over time, and we have our okay, two more sure. presenters. So, <laughs> thank no you. No problem. If you could just thought, uh, maybe yeah. finish up with yeah, a couple thoughts. Think, okay. Yeah, this is just the last slide, actually, that we've got three practical op action plans, and one specifically rate relates to buildings and sites. And so that's something that we're going to be uh, work working on a dedicated way with the community and industry on moving forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Melina. Uh, so our next speaker is Valerie Prestoli, who is the Director of Sustainable Business Innovation at NEC, a Canadian outdoor retail cooperative. Uh, responsible for o overseeing MEC sustainability strategy and programs encompassing the MEC label brand, MEC's retail product assortment, operational efficiency, as well as reporting and ad advocacy. Valerie holds a BCom in international business from the Vienna University of Economics and Business Administration and an MBA from the University of British Columbia. So thanks for joining us, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, on that somber note, thank you, Melina. I think this is a perfect segue into my presentation. So I'm here today to tell you about MEC's journey and our work with Salmon Safe and uh, share the perspective um, of a Salmon Safe certified site. So I get to give you a few examples of what Salmon Safe implementation looks like in practice. A bit of background about MEC. Um, Sorry, and I'm having a little bit of trouble with my slides here. There we go. So we are a uh, Canadian outdoor retail cooperative uh, headquartered here in BC. We've been around since 1971 and have a total of about uh, 5 million members across Canada, um, 5.4 million members across the globe, uh, with 22 stores across the country as well. And as an outdoor brand and retailer, we have a strong history of sustainability and sustainability is very much embedded into the co-op ethos and our DNA, which also extends to our building. So um, especially MEC's newest stores, as well as our head office um, on Great Northern Way in the Falls Creek Flats, where I'm located, have all followed um, sustainable design principles. And um, the head office here in our flagship store that I'm going to be talking about in um, over the next couple of minutes have all followed uh, wood-centric design um, with uh, cross-laminated timber uh, with the wood material um, for the new Vancouver flagship stores is uh, sustainably harvested uh, from pine beetle affected areas across BC. And with our stores, we really wanted to uh, create the feel of what MEC is all about in terms of being open, providing community spaces, being a very natural looking environment with uh, lots of lighting and being very inviting to our guests and really being part of the community that these buildings are located in. So for our head office, uh, this is a view of MEC's head office in the Falls Creek Flats area, um, which was, um, as um, Teresa mentioned at the start, uh, the first urban site to be Salmon Safe certified in 2015. What you can see here is a view from uh, the fourth floor rooftop. And you can see uh, both the blue and green roof uh, with a view out um, kind of northwest towards uh, the downtown area. And this uh, blue roof that we have captures rainwater in a, in a 7,700-gallon underground cistern. And this rainwater is being used for flushing toilets and, as well as irrigating the garden. And through that, it provides about 80% of our non-potable water needs uh, for the building which also reduces our potable water use by 55% as a result. To give you a bit more detail about the head office site, um, so as I said, we are located in the Falls Creek Flats, very close to that uh, Clark Drive um, outfall pipe uh, that Melina was talking about. And this was a former salt flats and um, mud flat area, and then it was turned into an industrial site. So when we built this building, 
uh, we actually uh, encountered a lot of contamination um, on the as we were excavating that we had to remediate. Uh, the building is LEED Platinum certified as well as STEM safe certified, as you know. And um, as part of that design and building, we address these uh, the SAM and SAFE principles that Teresa was referring to around stormwater management. I just told you about with the blue roof, uh, water use management, um, erosion prevention. Uh, we're also reducing pesticide use um, around the building through um, the contract that we have in place with our landscaping um, uh, provider. And we're really trying to um, filter stormwater through. Um, so other things that we do is that the, um, the rain and stormwater is managed through um, bioswales um, in our parking lot area that filter the particulate matter and, and absorb excess runoff. So the water is being cleaned before it's being discharged into the sewer system. Um, and we're also using native and waterwise plants to uh, reduce the need for irrigation as a whole, as well as providing habitat for, and food for songbirds. The other site that uh, is um, or has already been Salmon Safe certified and will be opened in uh, 2020 is our flagship store. Um, as you can see, uh, this is uh, not the most recent pictures, but it's still very much under construction. And this is uh, just down the road a bit further west in the Olympic Village uh, near Science World and um, has very much the same look, feel, and ethos um, as the head office. And again, it's very much about getting our membership, like fulfilling our purpose of getting our, our members active and outside. So this store is um, a three-story flagship store that is going to replace the existing uh, old store on uh, Broadway, um, just up the road. It is also an urban infill site. Um, it's designed to lead gold standards. Um, we won a Sam and Safe BC, BC design competition as part of that. And um, again, it has some of the very similar features of uh, the head office in terms of on-site stormwater treatment. So um, we do have, we treat the stormwater for both quality and quantity through a green roof and a rainwater harvesting system. Um, we also have bioretention cells um, that help to um, filter off the, the runoff of the water, um, capturing rainwater, um, as I said. Um, landscape maintenance is another piece of that to um, avoid pesticide use. And um, I think this is mostly it. Oh, and then, of course, um, how we use water within the building is all through low flow fixtures. Um, to um, and that combined with the rainwater harvesting system that we use for toilet flushing should uh, reduce the annual water demand by about almost 75 percent. I think it's around 73 um, percent that we're targeting. And one other piece of that is that we also want to, and I think that's kind of like leading me into is like why salmon safe for MEC is like one, it really aligns with our vision and our values. Um, Salmon Safe really provides some good management practices for, um, for water, which is important for us um, from a green buildings perspective. It also aligns with uh, LEED credits, so we get an innovation credit um, under the LEED um, system for the Salmon Safe certification, which is wonderful. There's also what's really important for us is just how staff feel every day they go to work because they spend a lot of time in their office building or in their store that they work in. So there is a certain sense of pride um, associated with that, which in turn creates staff engagement and that helps us better serve our members. And um, we're really trying to uh, promote our sustainability efforts to our membership as well as the communities that we are in um, to inspire community through education and outreach as well. And um, that's it from me. I hope that gave you a good overview of what um, Sam and Safe is all about at MEC. And if you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, and just a reminder to our attendees, if you, as you have questions, feel free to enter them into our Q&A box, uh, and we'll, we'll address those in the Q&A section. So I'd like to introduce our final presenter. Lucas Ozomajo, uh, who is an urban planner with experience and in sustainable building practices, green building certification, and community development. 
Lucas is currently supporting Dialogue's commitment to Architecture 2030, numerous community planning projects, as well as advocacy and outreach initiatives. So go for it, Lucas. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I just want to make sure that you're able to hear me right now. I've changed my settings on the meeting. Yeah, we're good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting us to participate in such a great organization of people. We're really humbled to be part of um, such an amazing panel. So we've been building a relationship with uh, the Fraser Basin Council and Salmon Safe BC over the last uh, several years, and we really found there's an alignment between our work and what the Fraser Basin Council is ultimately advocating for, um, and essentially what everyone on this panel is advocating for as well. So for context, um, Dialog uh, is an integrated design firm, and we have an overarching mission statement that ultimately guides all of the work that we do. So as designers, as facilitators, as advocates, as humans, as citizens, um, we really believe that design can and should meaningfully improve the well-being of our communities, as well as the environment we all share. And this really guides a lot of the work that we do. So the project I'm here to talk about today is 2150 Keith Drive. Um, so for context, that large road just to the east of the building is Clark Drive. So uh, what we've learned today is that that's the seventh most polluted um, street and outflow in the city of Vancouver. So it's a really interesting and challenging site to work with. Um, we're also adjacent to the Grandview Cut. We're adjacent to VCC Clark Sky Train Station. Uh, we have some important neighbors like MEC's head office as well as Lululemon's uh, future site as well. So this is a 10-story mass timber office building. It's approximately 160,000 square feet. Uh, it won the Salmon Safe BC design competition previously this year. Um, and it's also looking at on-site stormwater management, rainwater capture, and it's pursuing a whole slew of different certification programs, either through LEED or zero carbon building design, um, as well as wood innovation through Natural Resources Canada. Um, the interesting thing about this project is that one of the lead tenants and the client is actually Nature's Path. And um, if anyone knows anything about that organization, they are ultimately organic farmers and beekeepers and have a profound respect for the environment and a holistic perspective that they bring to everything they do. Um, so similar to our relationship with Fraser Basin Council, there's an alignment of values between uh, the client and ourselves as designers. And what this has led to is essentially a series of principles that have guided the design process. Um, one being that we should be mirroring the patterns of nature and learning from ecological relationships and how a building could be shaped by elements such as sun, wind, light, and water. Um, but also that building should grow from the site and should emerge from the landscape, um, which has led to decisions around mass timber structural elements. And then this idea of a garden and that we can actually grow food on site. So a previously industrialized site, we can remediate and improve the urban ecological function to a point that we can actually eat food from it. Um, and all of this is really based in the idea of regenerative design um, and a transition from doing less harm to doing more good and actually improving urban ecological functions and having a net positive contribution to the health of ecosystems. So what we're doing right now is currently studying what can be done with stormwater, stormwater management on site. Um, and really a, a shout out to MEC for being an inspiration for 2150 Keith Drive. Um, the client and design team have toured that building several times and that's really provided a lot of confidence for both the use of mass timber but also rainwater systems. So this one is currently conveying, capturing and treating the stormwater and rainwater that falls on the site. Um, and adjacent to the building will be a cascading bioswale, which will also treat the stormwater uh, prior to being released into the stormwater system. Um, what's really powerful about this in Salmon Safe is that it takes us beyond not just the building, but beyond the site as well. So as soon as you start to recognize that how you approach the site and building design will ultimately impact the urban watershed, which includes the ocean and streams, and impact salmon habitat and orcas, it changes the conversation to be more meaningful and to be more impactful. Um, so definite alignment with what was spoken about Slavertooth and that there's this need for awareness and stewardship of the land um, and just pushing for higher standards of water quality ultimately. So that's uh, a real inspiration for us and for future generations to hold that long-term perspective that we need. Um, similarly, in terms of material use on the building, think about the longevity of this project 
um, and that the decisions we make now will ultimately impact the life of the building. So one is to include mass timber, which has a lower in environmental impact. Uh, fun fact is that we can grow enough wood to build the structure within 14 minutes in North America. And that's a really powerful narrative that we hold. Um, another important consideration, which we learned through this process, uh, Martin, who's not able to join right now, but is a partner at Dialogue, likes to tell a story of how his entire career he's been trying to design a building with zinc panels. And that came to be true uh, quite recently at UBC. And following that celebration of achievement, uh, learned that zinc actually has a very detrimental impact to downstream habitat. Um, so we are humbled as designers uh, that this is a learning process and new information is constantly being generated. And we really appreciate Sam and Safe BC's ability to provide that research and to provide that education for us to be better informed. Um, so these are ultimately small changes, but we need to be open to those conversations and be open to learning and changing how we approach design. Um, so the landscape material choice and selection has definitely been informed by that new piece of information around zinc and copper, um, but also by the client's values. And so here's another shot just of the cascading bioswales. So this is a long, narrow building. So any opportunity to bring in views of nature into the building, uh, we're taking advantage of. So as a summary of takeaways, um, what we see as really valuable is that through Sam and Safe BC and the Fraser Basin Council, we can share a positive story, one that emphasizes regeneration, um, but also one that thinks beyond the building footprint and the impact of design beyond just the site and looking for ways in which we can enhance the urban ecological function and advocate for change. Um, and supporting this is the expertise, research, education that's provided through organizations such as FBC. And finally, accountability. So what will hold us accountable ultimately is a process-oriented certification framework. And we really appreciate the, the level of flexibility that this framework provides and the information that is provided by FBC. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lucas. Uh, so now we're going to move into our question and answer part of our webinar. Uh, so we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So I've got a couple questions coming in um, and I've added them to our queue, but please do as we go, if you have a question, just add it to the question box there on, on the GoToWebinar menu and we'll address it as, as they come in. So um, our first question is from Karen Debit. And uh, her question is, does the Salmon Safe certification program include criteria that the development project meets or exceeds municipal, oops, municipal bylaws around riparian setbacks? Um, and so we have our uh, Salmon Safe um, US uh, certification specialist on the line with us, uh, Anna Huddle. So I'm going to um, allow her to address this question first. So. There you go. All right. Sure, thank you. Hi, Kelsey. And thank you for the question, Karen. Um, while our assessment, our standards don't explicitly reference um, codes and bylaws since we do walk, work across <clears throat> various regions, um, we don't uh, explicitly require exceedance of municipal bylaws, but we do generally look for projects to go above and beyond codes and bylaws. Um, and so that, so looking at riparian setbacks in particular would be something that we would evaluate um, in in depth as part of the on-site assessment with our full site, uh, full science team. Great, thanks, Anna. Um, yeah. So um, our next question is from John Black, and I'm going to direct this one to Lucas. Uh, just a question about the last presentation. So it's, what does mass timber mean? So if you can expand on that a little bit. Uh, essentially, it's a way of formulating wood in that it can be a structural element. Um, so it's an engineered wood product that can take different forms. So cross laminated timber uh, is also dowel laminated timber. So you're essentially increasing the structural capacity of wood by making it in mass. Great, thanks, Lucas. Um, okay, so the next question is from Craig at Coquitlam First Nation. Uh, hi, Craig, can someone explain how or if this links to the water sustainability plan tool from under the provincial WSA? So yeah, I'm not sure um, 
who would be best to answer this question, but if any of our uh, any of our panelists want to chime in or I'll see if Melina has any insights in this in, into this one, but I mean maybe I'll I'll start with a, a few thoughts. It's Teresa Fresco here um, from the Salmon Safe BC side. Um, we haven't done an analysis of how the salmon safe standards align with the, um, the Provincial Water Sustainability Act, but what I will say uh, and what is echoed in the standards is that any sites that we do undertake assessments for um, have to abide by all uh, laws of, the, of where that site is located jurisdictionally. Um, so any federal, provincial, municipal, regional, and First Nation laws um, that are that any developers need to abide by, that's also kind of the, the standing rules that the site would need to abide by in addition to what is uh, articulated in the standards. Um, but I but I will open it up to our panelists and maybe Melina, if you've done some thinking about, you know, when you guys have been putting together the Rain City strategy, um, which has some alignment with Salmon Safe, how that aligns with the Water Sustainability Act of BC. Thanks, Teresa. Actually, unfortunately, um, Craig, I actually am not familiar with that tool, but I'm I'm going to look it up now. So <laughs> I I don't know how it aligns with that particular tool, so I I can't speak to that. But I know like with some of the work that's happened in the past with um, the regional government and the municipalities and thinking about the stormwater pollutants, I know that the 48 millimeters um, that there was a link back to thinking about fish health in terms of the amount of uh, stormwater that should be managed or the volume that should be managed. But I'm, I'll have to look up that particular tool. Unfortunately, I don't know how it links. All right. Thanks, Melita. Um, yeah, so our next question is from Heather Wright. Uh, and the question is, to what extent is there collaboration with Green Shores? Yeah, it's Teresa here again, so I can speak to that. Um, we are actively talking with the Stewardship Center of BC, uh, in particular um, C.G. Blair and her team um, who lead the Green Shores Certification Program. And we're continuing, continuing to discuss uh, where we can do some research on the areas of alignment because we do see in our conversations we have been able to identify uh, so many areas that uh, both standards align. Um, and really it's just a function of capacity and funding and trying to um, get our, our teams to do that analysis of, of both standards. So it's, it's coming. Um, we're just hoping to be able to secure more funding to be able to do it. So thank you, Heather, for the thought. It's a good nudge for us to continue that work. Great. Uh, so I've got the next one is from Ryan Preston. And first of all, Ryan sent us a helpful link. So uh, he said, regarding the water sustainability plans, there's a useful document from the Okanagan. So I'm going to share that link in the chat in a few moments. Um, but he also has a question. Uh, and so Ryan asks, in BC, has there been any further thought to consideration of salmon safe certification for greenfield development sites in the interest of mitigating or avoiding impacts to salmon habitat? So it's Teresa here again. And Anna, I will acknowledge as well if she wants to chime in. So maybe just uh, put an unmute on, on Anna. Um, in terms of the BC program, uh, again, we're just getting our, our feet under us um, with new staff on board and uh, getting a bit more capacity to move things forward. So we haven't actually explored this quite yet. Um, but our BC assessment team folks have brought this forward as an idea. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of, of putting that on our strategic planning list so we can address it um, when we do have a little bit more bench strength. Um, but I do want to maybe acknowledge Anna with this question to see if there has been any research or um, further idea making on, on the US side. Yeah, well, I would say that we have um, some a program in place already for like parks and natural areas um, for sites you know, that we would consider green fields. Um, but as far as um, in the urban development realm, sites that are green fields that would be developed um, because we are trying to, um, you know, obviously conserve and preserve those um, high priority areas, we have not made a special effort to move in that direction um, just yet as, as those two ideas overlap. But um, as I would just echo what um, Teresa was saying and that it's, you know, it's an area of opportunity that I think um, you know, we obviously want to 
um, be helpful to projects and influence them to to be the most environmentally sensitive that they can, even if that project doesn't ultimately pursue um, certification. Great, thanks, Anna. Uh, and another just note, quick note from Craig. Uh, he just sent in the chat that Paulus and Uvic uh, put out a great report um, on the tool that we mentioned a minute ago. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we have another question uh, from Heather Wright, who asks, "Is there support for community groups to contribute to monitoring impacts?" Mm -hmm. And it's Teresa here again from the BC program. Thanks for your question, Heather. Uh, we started to explore in a baby step kind of way um, this question of monitoring water quality uh, for any of the salmon safe sites here in BC that would be uh, interested in, in having that um, done on their site. Um, and we started with uh, some uh, getting an internship student from Simon Fraser University uh, with a specialty in stormwater management and, and engineering. And his research just focused on uh, doing a literature review of all of the uh, information that we know about water quality monitoring, um, in particular for, for stormwater, and uh, just some of the research uh, on stormwater impacts to salmon health. Um, and then in addition to that, he did a, a cursory review of um, imagining what a monitoring program for salmon safe could look like, how much it would cost, which groups are out there that are currently monitoring that we could partner with. Um, and so really just a, a, a really first cut, if you will, um, on what that could look like. So I'm, I, if you are with an organization that does some monitoring, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and maybe we can take a look at that research um, together and see where we can strengthen it and whether there is feasibility to do monitoring on site uh, whether through partnering with uh, local governments or, or First Nations governments or uh, even with community groups, which I know are active in, in citizen science at the moment. So um, we've started thinking about it, but if you have any other ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so I wanted to put um, a question to our panelists. Uh, so uh, I guess whenever you know you feel like it, you can chime in. But uh, the question is, what advice would you offer to those who are interested or or curious about the salmon safe process and are thinking about um, thinking about it in any way? Uh, Lindsay here from Safe Nation. Um, I think if people are interested in salmon safe, there's lots of information available online and. Also, there's so much information about salmon in general and, and things that they're vulnerable to that it might be worthwhile to look at that, to have that kind of, just even like a very broad technical understanding of like, you know, how does stormwater affect salmon? Why is copper bad? Like, how does that affect them? And then you just kind of have that base of understanding about why you're doing what you're doing. It's uh, Valerie here from MEC. Like one other thing that I would add probably um, to what Lindsay just said is also to figure out like how it ties in with your organizational values and what connection you can make. Because it might not be that you have salmon as the high priority, um, but it could be anything else that, you know, salmon is related to and figure out how you can frame it up in a way that it does become relevant for your organization. Hi, Melina here. I guess the only thought I would offer uh, is that I know some different developers or members of the community or people that might be commissioning some type of a development may not be sure where to start if they want to strive for something that's more resilient and better in terms of the environmental outcomes for aquatic ecosystems. And I guess the the value of something like Salmon Safe is that it creates a structure and a process to go about actually delivering some outcomes. And I know that in the green building sector, that's been extremely helpful to have systems such as LEED and um, you know Built Green or Passive House to have a bit of a structure and a process for how you actually go about getting to performance outcomes. Um, and so anyway, I think that's a, an advantage. I would also just add, um, having a conversation with Teresa can be really <laughs> inspiring. So, uh, <laughs> personally, that's the the route I would go. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, I have another question from Matthew Bailey. 
Um, and it's how do you plan to approach or expand to other municipalities with important salmon habitat and ongoing development? Uh, and he gives the example of Squamish or the Campbell River. Um, I'm going to give this one to Teresa first. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the, the question, Matthew. And this is a very good question. It's something that we are actively thinking about um, here at, at the Fraser Basin Council office now that I have two new fabulous staff who are, who are definitely giving me a bit more bench strength as it was just me prior to that. Um, so we've, we've been actively talking about how do we continue doing online outreach like this? I'm glad that you're on the line um, asking these questions. And I, it was also really great to see the number of local governments that had actually uh, signed up for the webinar. We had a number of staff all over the province um, signing up for this. So uh, we, we hope to continue offering four webinars a year um, to bring everyone together in this virtual space. Um, present some of the activities and events that we're doing, um, showcasing examples like we did today of, of Salmon Safe Sites and, and being able to take um, questions from the audience and, and answer them and connect. So we're hoping to continue that work. Um, we also want to be able to uh, have a chance to speak with municipal staff in, as we continue uh, building those partnerships on the online space. We're hoping people will reach out and say hello um, and vice versa and shoulder tap them and, and be able to set meetings and start building those relationships. Um, Fraser Basin Council, for, for those of you on the line that know us, um, we do a lot of work with local government and so we're, we're trying to leverage on those partnerships to um, spread the word about Salmon Safe BC and, and work directly with the staff um, in the environmental departments and other departments that that would have an interest in this kind of work. So really it's just um, two-way communication, folks reaching out to us and saying hello and, and us um, knocking on doors and shoulder tapping to, to do some presentations for them. And hopefully bit by bit we'll continue um, reaching out outside of the realm of the Lower Mainland. All right. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to wrap up. Um, that's all the questions that we have. So, um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar. And uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, the third and final webinar in this series, we're aiming for it to be in February 2020. So stay tuned for more information about when that's going to be. And um, as we mentioned, we're going to be posting a recording of this webinar online. So it will be available if you want to revisit it or share it with colleagues who weren't able to make it. Uh, and again, a reminder that the first webinar in the series can be found online, which uh, goes into some more detail on the Salmon Safe program. So if you just go to the Fraser Basin Council on, on YouTube, that's where you can find it. Um, we also have a short survey. So just um, if you have a minute, please share some feedback with us so that we can continue to improve our communications. Uh, there's four questions and it should take you less than one minute to complete. And that should pop up once we, uh, once we close this webinar. And finally, a huge, huge thank you to our presenters. We really appreciate the time you've taken out of your busy lives to share your knowledge and experiences with us. So that's, uh, that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.